<coughs> oh, that's new. That is that new. Is new. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, usual weekly New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Tonight, we have fabulous Chris Epting, a real renaissance man who, <laughs> who does everything, and I'll explain that, and then he'll explain it, just so you're aware of what's going on. Next week, we have Steve uh, Treader uh, returning. The Horace Stoneham book will be out uh, this week. Uh, the following week, we have Judith Pesta, who wrote a book on Sal Magley. Then Peter Laskowicz, who's here tonight, is a historian, lecturer, and tour guide. He will be talking about uh, the Giants and the Polo Grounds in depth. He, he leads many um, walks uh, around New York City and the Polo Ground area, and he'll let you know about that if you uh, want to attend one of his uh, yes. walks. <laughs> There you go, Chris. <laughs> uh, I'll come back just for that. Um, and then in July, we have a, a couple of people tentatively lined up. So we're good. Uh, you know, at the end of this meeting, if you want to talk about if we should uh, continue going, you know, every week or in the summertime, mm -hmm. you know, some of you might need a break. Some, you know, a lot of people let me know today they were not able to attend because they're going to the giant game in San Francisco. So. Anyway, um, I met Chris about uh, over 10 years ago. He spoke at a, a Queens Historical Society, and he spoke about these two books, The Early uh, Polar Grounds and this book, Roadside Baseball, which is just a fabulous uh, book of monuments and things having to do with baseball all around our country. Um, just the, he... Chris, not you know, I was so happy to get back in touch with him. Not only is he a great author, he's on TV. Every time I turn on Reels TV, the guy's there talking about John Belushi, talking about musicians. You know, he is really culturally, you know, knows everything about uh, culture in our in our uh, country regarding stuff that probably a lot of you really would enjoy hearing. So, without further ado, Chris, the floor is yours. You want to talk about both of those books or talk about your career or whatever you want. This should be a very fun and interesting night. So I, Preservation Society, I give you Chris Epton. Thank you, Gary. Listen, man, it was great to get back in touch with you and be here tonight with all of you like-minded, um, beautifully crazy people. It really is, uh, you know, it's so nice to um, always to be in a space, whether in person or on Zoom with people who get it. Just just hearing your your side chatter got me so excited sitting here, listening to what you talk about. It was so wonderfully refreshing. So, Gary, how long would you like me to go for, by the way, just so I have a sense of time? Anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, Q&A. Whatever you want. They can ask questions after you're done presenting. All right, or cool. During it, I, may go, I may go a little bit longer. That's fine. Me. It won't feel like that. But you guys, so what I want to do is I've got a presentation put together uh, about some of these places I've been to. And then I want to end with something really special that I've been going through the last couple of years um, on a book project that's been kind of... Um, derailed for now as you'll hear but nevertheless uh i think has a lot going for it and it's a lot of fun to talk about um first of all i never went to the polo grounds i was three when it was torn down yet i have something about the polo grounds that i've never gotten over as a kid growing up in westchester every book i looked through there was something about the polo grounds that i would say to my father do you think i had a chance like, could we have driven by it when i was a baby or whatever he didn't really know but i would start going back to that site in the 70s trying to line up you know what used to be here and there and everywhere and that really got me on this path of wanting to go explore places so i've got let me pull up my um um you know what if you can enable make sure i can yep. share a screen i'm gonna give you share screen i want the i need the power i want all the power to i think I, I, gave, I, I, I got your shared screen i don't know where there we you're go around, but if you do, Perfect. Your, there you go. Perfect. Can, can everybody see this? All right, so I'll buzz through this stuff. So I, I've written, you know, a number of baseball books. I live in Orange County, California. And so I did a book about the, the baseball history here. And there's a lot of it. I mean, this was one of the oil teams that existed. Walter Johnson, 
um, you know, I grew up, you know, when he was 13, he moved to Orange County, a place called Olinda, and his career started in Orange County. So I'll get to him later. Uh, I did a book on LA's historic ballpark. This is one of my favorite photos. The, the bizarre scenario that was the Dodgers at the Coliseum, which even seeing a photo like this, it still makes little little sense to me when you consider a see that here was about 800 feet from home plate. Um, but nevertheless, it worked for a number of years. Um, the early polo grounds, as I mentioned, this book is really in the late 1800s through about the late 1920s. As you can see, there's a forward by the great Arnold Haino. I had, um, when I was, I mean, I like many of you, uh, A Day of the Bleachers is one of my favorite books. And I had um, read it, you know, all through my life. And then uh, I wrote him in the early 90s. I wrote him a fan letter, not pre-internet, not knowing if it would ever get to him. And I think two years went by, literally. And I get a letter, like an airmail letter with the red, white, and blue piping around it from the rainforest of Costa Rica, from Arnold Haino. The let my letter had made it to him. He was in the in the uh, Peace Corps with his wife, and he wrote me this really nice letter thanking me for you know being a fan of his and all that. So. About a uh, number of years later, probably in the early 2000s, I'm, it's Christmas time. I'm uh, in a Barnes and Noble with my son, and I said, "Hey, I want to get you a copy of this book, Day in the Bleachers." And on it, I take it off the shelf, and it says, "Signed by local author." So I look. I go home. I call directory. Arnold Hanna lives in Laguna. I call the number. He answers. We're on the phone for about two hours. It's, it's a wonderful conversation. I end up taking him to a Dodger game a month or two later at the start of the season. And I write an LA Times Magazine article called Back to the Bleachers, where I went back with him to the bleachers and watched a game kind of through his eyes today. And um, we became friends after that. So when I was finishing this book, I had not even thought about this, but the night before it was due, I called him and I said, Mr. Haino, I hate to bother you, but is there any way you can write like a brief forward? And he goes, uh, uh, yeah, let, let me go to work. Boom, hangs up. And the next morning I receive about a, 2,500 or 3,000 word forward. It's like, if you ever see this book, get it for his forward. It's wonderful. He was there. He saw McGraw there. As a kid, he would sneak into the polo grounds. I think his uncle was a cop who could get him in. But Arnold Hanna, who's still going strong out here in Orange County at 97, I think, just a remarkable guy who I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, all right, so for me, I always had this bug about going attaching myself to baseball places that affected me personally. On the left, all of you, I'm sure, recognize the Duck Pond Field in Croton-on-Hudson, where I played my very first Little League game right here. Um, that's an important one to me, as was Shea Stadium. That's where I saw my first baseball game in 1970 um, with my dad. And so I think we all, be, if I were to ask you all, where to tell me about your very first game, you could probably all do it. We, we never forget that first game. So this gets me going, as does Babe Ruth. Uh, second or third grade, a friend of mine, Tommy Monahan, is reading a book about Babe Ruth, who I thought was a woman. I thought the name Babe Ruth, I don't know who it was. And he says, no, 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 um, he was a baseball player. So then my dad tells me about him, and I become, as a kid, a Babe Ruth devotee. I really, I, I cannot get enough about reading about him. And then I learned that he's laid to rest about 20 minutes from our house. Uh, and of course, in Valhalla, New York, at Gate of Heaven Cemetery. And so I start making an August 16th pilgrimage there each year as a kid for I don't know, 10 years. My mom would take me. I would bring, put my Yankee hat there, you know, lay wreath or something, go get another hat after that, play in the hat all year. Became a Mecca, became a pilgr pilgrimage for me. And um, first time I went to Cooperstown, seeing that locker, uh, I still get goosebumps. I mean, it's literally, it's, uh, that was a game changer for me. And when I was about 11, when I went through the first time, that's when the idea of roadside baseball came into my head. Was, I went to the gift shop looking for a book that would go to all those places. And there wasn't one. So I said, you know what? When I get older, I'm going to do this. And I did it. And the third edition came out about a year or so ago. And I'm very, this of all the books I've written, this to me is really, uh, it's the true labor of love. Um, you know, my, a friend of mine, took this picture he was back there uh two years ago somebody put that book uh, I, it wasn't me i promise i've been at babe's, at babe's grave and i thought wow that's that's pretty cool right there so you get these little moments sometimes you know for me having a son who loves baseball this is charlie on the left at about right. seven years old at angel stadium we'll always go back and kind of complete that cycle of re-photographing sites to just kind of show 
um, the effects of time on all of us. Some new places in the book, some great new museums right. that have opened up since the first edition. Uh, Hank Aaron, um, you know, museum dedicated to him, uh, Roberta Clemente. There have been some really nice things that I've been able to discover. You know, in the early 70s, when I was playing Little League, the Bad News Bears, it could have been based on our team. My coach was like that. My coach drank beer in the dugout. Like that was not a big deal in 1972. And so when this movie came out, it was it was a big thing for us. We felt like our lives had been immortalized. So I had to go find the field out in the San Fernando Valley. Interestingly, um, there wasn't a field there. The, the production company went out there and said to the town, look, if we build a field, can we shoot here? We will leave the field for you. And the Little League field there today is actually a, a baseball history artifact because it was created for Bad News Bears. Um, Sandlot, my favorite baseball movie uh, most of the time. And uh, I went out to Utah, which is where most of it was shot, to find the field. This is actually the field where the Sandlot was shot with the dog on the other side of the fence there. Um, another uh, thing, there was a, an anesthesiologist, some of you may know, who began placing markers in honor of Negro League players who didn't have markers, who were basically in unmarked graves. And so I interviewed him for the book and I was very proud to include all of the Negro League markers that he had uh, included uh, in the book. Out in, um, okay, this was Bush Stadium in Indianapolis. I'm only going fast because I know what I have here. I want to show you something really quickly. When they were tearing that ballpark down, somebody who shall remain nameless went and got me the mail slot from the ballpark <laughs> when it was being torn down. This is my idea of treasure. Well, thankfully, the place doesn't get completely torn down. It actually, this is it as they were tearing it down. Today, it was been repurposed into an apartment complex, a minor league ballpark, Negro league ballpark. I love when that happens. I like when, um, you know, there's some thought given to saving something like that. I think this was a, a wonderful repurposing in Indianapolis. Uh, it, it, you know, San Francisco, the Giants have put together a wonderful museum. I'm sure some of you visited it, if not all of you. But that, that polo ground sign, the lettering they've got there, that for me is an absolute showstopper. Uh, of course, we remember those letters from around here, that there were two sets of them, one out here as well. But to see, to see these today, in that museum is, uh, I think, is, is very, very special. They've got some great other artifacts there as well from the Polo Grounds. Uh, thankfully, a plaque was fine, a formal plaque placed where Lou Gehrig was born on the Upper East Side of New York. Again, these were all things that happened since the first edition of the book. And this is why I want to keep expanding that book every five years or so, because there's this wonderful movement afoot that a lot of fans have undertaken this idea of commemorating places and spaces. I mean, they can't tear a ball back, ballpark down today and not mark the bases with plaques and things. So, um, you know, Old Town Martinez, uh, DiMaggio's birthplace, you know, another great uh, newish sign that's up there in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Uh, Six Stadium in, uh, in Seattle. You go there today, I think it's a Lowe's, I think it's a, it was a Home Depot before, I believe it's a Lowe's now. Back in the lumber yard, as you can see here, Home Plate is still right there. They actually painted a batter's box on the floor with the statue of a batter there to, again, give you that perspective. If you wanna go stand there and think about where Six Stadium used to be and what it was like, you can, as long as you have Home Plate, the mind can fill in the rest of what used to be there. Um, of course, the, uh, the brush staircase uh, leading down to the polo grounds. I remember writing an article about this for Preservation Magazine about 15 years ago. And after that, um, the, uh, the Giants, the Jets, and the Yankees all started kicking in some money to preserve that up there. I know you've got a great tour guide here who's going to, uh, I'm sure, walk, walk up there in the next week or so with the tour. But another wonderful artifact, you know, artifact that brings this stuff back to life. The Dodgers on the club level in the last few years at Dodger Stadium have done, I think, a really good job. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this later, but my experiences at Dodger Stadium. Uh, and I'm no Dodger fan, believe me, but I've had I've had a, a sort of the, the quintessential Dodger experience in the last two years. But, you know, things like the ball, the uh, bullpen card up there and lots of other artifacts. Tommy Lasorda's uh, seats or Sinatra's seat, actually, that he would sit in and Lasorda and Sinatra obviously were, were, were very good pals. So for me, 
I'm a ballpark guy. I, I'm a ballpark guy. These are the places. I never went to Shy Park. My dad, that was his ballpark as a kid. He grew up outside Philadelphia. I remember visiting my relatives in Wyomissing, Pennsylvania, I think in 71. And there was a news report. Ballpark had been closed already, but it was on fire. I remember watching the, uh, the news and it was heartbreaking to me to see the plumes of smoke and the, the, the flames shooting up of this, uh, I mean, I think arguably the most beautiful, architecturally, the most beautiful park of its era. I mean, certainly a tie yeah. with that field, but uh, you look at this, a photo like this, and of course you go there today, and fittingly it's a church. And I, you know, that to me, for a lot of us, you know, ballparks are sanctuaries. They are church-like to us. So when you can have a church on a location like that, it's kind of special. Ebbets, of course, not too much needed here in the way of description, um, but again, uh, I wish there was a little bit more done there beyond just the apartments and the sign. There are little things here today, but, you know, I like lining things up like this. I like sort of superimposing the old with the news to just give you a sense of where you're walking. And I give tours once in a while, too, in certain spots. And it's always this thing about, you know, watch where you're walking. You're walking through like layers of ghosts when you're here. The Dodgers walked in that front entrance many a time. You know, uh, the, my relatives, all of my Brooklyn Dodger fans, uh, who came over from, you know, immigrated through uh, Ellis Island. They were Brooklyn Dodger fans. So when you go to, to places like this, they are sacred. They are special. When you can take Jackie Robinson and line up literally where he stood on the sidewalk there. Mm. Uh, I'd love to see a little sign right there. You know, that Jackie Robinson stood right there. These are the places that matter to me anyway. Birthplace of Jackie Robinson in Cairo, Georgia, a spot that his, I believe his cousin, a doctor, I believe she spearheaded the project to have that marker placed. Um, Forbes Field, if you haven't been to Pittsburgh, oh, yeah. uh, one of the great, really great remnants is this chunk of outfield wall that's still there. Home plate still sits under glass in one of the University of Pittsburgh uh, hallways just across the way. When you can go out there and stand and think about Roberto Clemente, all the pirates and everyone else who patrolled that, that acreage out there, with the wall right there, that allows you to really fill in the blanks. This really is, to me, I wish Forbes Field was still there. It's not, but a big chunk of it is. I mean, arguably as big a piece of any major ballpark next to League Park in Cleveland. Uh, in, the, in the sidewalk, there's a, a little plaque marking the exact spot where Maz's home run, you know, well, actually this one here just lines the brick of where the, uh, the wall ran. There's another marker marking the spot where Mazeroski's home run sailed over the wall. And there's the aforementioned uh, home plate, which yeah, is under yeah. glass in the hallway in Pittsburgh. So again, somebody was thinking about this there, or, or, or a group was thinking about how do we protect and preserve these memories, not just for pirate fans, but for baseball fans, for fans of American history. Babe Ruth hit his last home runs uh, there. Uh, 714 became Bush. the first home run to go over the roof at Forbes Field. So when you stand in that vicinity today, you're all of a sudden connected uh, to that moment and many others as well. Huntington Avenue grounds. I went to college up in Boston. I used to love kind of scoping out where the first World Series was played, 1903. What they've done up there is really cool. You've got Cy Young, a statue, uh, at the site where the pitcher's mound would have been, and then 60-some-odd feet away, of course, a home plate marker talking about the first World Series and all the other history there. So again, people that have these things placed are are my kind of people. They're, they're not thinking of the present, they're thinking about the future. And people like us and our kids and our grandkids that love baseball, that wanna go create that attachment to great places like this. Of course, the Mall of America up in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, Harmon Killebrew, one of his most prudicious home run. Ballpark's gone at City Mall of America, but they've got the chair up there on the wall, <laughs> right? Where the ball landed, and down in Camp Snoopy, home plate is marked. So once you're there at home plate, you can look off and see that chair in the distance. And all of a sudden, it may not be the Met anymore, but you kind of get a sense of what it was like there. Uh, uh, Braves Field up in Boston, no longer there, of course. It's now part of, it's Nickerson Field, University of Boston, or Boston University. But here you've got the uh, some of the team offices and ticket booth still there, this wonderful old building. And once you know this is there, you can realize that the uh, some of the bleachers in right field, along the right field line, are original and were original Braves Field artifacts. Back to the polo grounds a little bit. 
you know, you can line things up sometimes in a way that's kind of fun. Uh, I love noticing how the curvature of the road there still the same. You can get the high bridge in your sight. And, and again, just realize that the polo grounds would have backed up uh, to right around here. And again, there's something about this ballpark. I, you know, even after decades of studying it and, and obsessing over it, I still can't really make sense out of what it is about this park that so captivates me. Um, but yet it does. There's always something new for me to learn about the Polo Grounds. Um, yeah, new Yankee Stadium, of course. You know, it's nice they've preserved uh, the old diamond there. And so you can line up where Lou Gehrig stood. And we see the buildings here that line up. And again, very to be able to step into... These scenes from baseball history to me um, never stops being powerful. Down at Lane Field in San Diego, where the Pacific Coast League Padres play, they've done a really nice job of creating um, sort of the ambience of a field. We can see here where the ballpark used to be, right against the ocean, scenic, you know, just a gorgeous, gorgeous area for a park. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, the, the, when you see the pitcher's mound, they've got a keyhole here, and there's a home plate marker. And they've made a park here. And there's some really nice history here. If you go down there, there's a plaque with Sabre placed. You know, Ted Williams um, got a start there. Jackie Robinson played there. Uh, really very important place. I remember as a kid watching Mets games on TV. And whenever they play the Expos, I let uh, Exhibition or Expo. Uh, Jerry Park. Jerry Park. I'm sorry, Jerry Park. <laughs> The swimming pool, you know, I remember one game where Russ Stop hit a ball and Ralph Connor was talking about that pool. And, you know, so you go up there today and, and uh, it's still there, you know, the pool is still there. The park's gone. It's a tennis facility now. But again, as long as there's something there, it's fun to kind of line things up. Uh, some of my favorite baseball photos involve the relationship between these two ballparks and just the craziness that you have the polo grounds in Yankee Stadium. Um, in each other's orbit like this. I remember the first time I saw this picture as a kid, I thought it was a fake. I didn't think this was physically possible that two baseball stadiums, the, the greatest structures in the world could be that close to one another. Then I had relatives who said, oh yeah, we'd go to a Yankee game and then walk over the McCombs Bridge. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the Giants Yankees thing um, became an important thing for me to research and study as a kid. And of course today, Things are radically different, um, but we all know this is when the ballpark had just come down. Uh, it wasn't a field yet, the old ballpark. Um, but again, and if anybody had told us back then that the original Yankee Stadium would be torn down, I doubt many of us would have believed it. Um, some other sites here, where are we today? We are in Milwaukee at Old County Stadium, which is gone, of course, but they preserved the field as well. It's a, it's a child's diamond today on the exact site. Where, where county used to be. So again, as, as time in more modern age, I think preservation has taken on a more, um, a more thoughtful presentation. And I like that people have really started thinking about this stuff. Crossley Field, oh, yeah. Maddie, of course, no longer there, but uh, there's a men's uh, rehab facility there today. I was there about two years ago with my son. And if you go into the dining room, they have markers in the dining room where like second base used to be. So they've really taken it to the next level. And, uh, and again, some great things outside, like here, they've got a nice display with seats and, and the history of Crosley Field, little wall of fame. There's a beautiful mural there that helps kind of bring the history to life. And home plates at the original home plate site sits in an alleyway, Crosley Field right there. No big deal, no plaque, no marker. Somebody just painted it there where it used to be which is also, it's so subtle. It almost makes it a little bit more special than having some big ornate brass marker. Uh, one of my favorites is League Park in Cleveland. Never had lights. So it was always about daytime baseball there. Uh, 18, late 1890s, Cy Young pitched there. Played ball there till I believe the late 40s. Uh, Joe DiMaggio got uh, the last hit in his streak uh, at League Park. Interestingly, I believe that was on a Friday. They played weekday games there because there were no lights in smaller crowds. But by then for the weekends, they had moved over to municipal to accommodate larger crowds. Um, Babe Ruth hit his 500th home run here. A number of other things took place there. And today, if you go there, the diamond is preserved. Um, the team office, offices are still there. The uh, wall that used to run up and down, wow. the right field uh, fence is still there. 
So League Park is a great success story in terms of having a small museum there. We can see outside this great postcard where the trolley cars used to run, team offices here, deep in the right field corner, and that building is still there, as is the wall. So this is, an, again, another very substantial piece of baseball history that has been kept alive. Um, I mentioned Forbes Field. These adventures, uh, Charlie and I have been to so many of these places. And for me, this is really uh, the best part of it is having him there. It's because uh, he loves this. And so we can share stories and, uh, and all that. In the, in the third edition of Roadside Baseball, there's a story about Ernest Buddy Telfera. He was this gentleman right here. 1934 American Legion team in Springfield, Massachusetts, a really good baseball team. Teenagers, uh, they went a birth down in North Carolina uh, to play uh, leading up to the finals, the national championship. They learn when they get down there that their uh, bunny Talaferro is not going to be allowed to play because he's black. And these kids, these 13 and 14 year olds, take a vote and they vote to go home without playing on behalf of their friend. And it's a big deal. South resents Negro on team. This was a, a huge deal. The coaches left it up to the kids to decide this. And so for roadside baseball, I wanted to go to the field where they played in Springfield. And uh, again, the story is just, just incredible. And um, this is the field today. And there's a marker there called Brothers All Are We. And that, um, you know, that's exactly where they played. And that's where, uh, you know, these kids really stepped up. And uh, I'm just writing my daughter really quick. So again, for roadside baseball, with the third edition, I wanted to expand it to include, you know, kind of bigger sites, not just major league sites. Um, Getting to Babe Ruth for a second here. One of my favorite spots is a little speck on the map called Dunsmere, California, a little logging town. And um, it's uh, Babe was there as part of Barnstorming Tour 19, I believe 22 and 24 remarkably somehow in this little town right by the Oregon border, that freaking field is still there. The oh ball park is there. And when you stand there today and just think about what it had to be like, look at everyone dressed up, shirts, ties, hats, top coats. It's a big deal. And this is a logging town. Babe Ruth came to town and, and to stand there today, uh, I get goosebumps seeing that picture you think about what it had to be like that day and when just what the dad babe ruth and it's a tiny town today in the early 1920s i can't even imagine how obscure it was and and, and there babe ruth was um down in hot springs arkansas my son and i went down there we had to go explore where the uh spring you know teams played in the early late late 19s early 20s where Babe Ruth uh, hit. Now, this is interesting because it's 1918. It's during the last pandemic. A lot of players have become ill. That's what originally predicates, one of the reasons anyhow, Babe Ruth becoming an everyday player. They needed bodies on the team, the Red Sox, where they played down there. Ruth also uh, began solidifying his myth when he hit a ball um, from this park, uh, this is where home plate was. Yesterday, they have a marker where home plate was across the field into an alligator farm, some 500 and some odd feet. The alligator farm is still there. The pool, the pool where the ball landed is marked with the sign. Winnington Park was across the street, March 17, 1918, Hot Springs, Arkansas. When we were down there, one of the alligators. Alligators live a long time. One of the alligators in the pool would have been there the day Babe Ruth at that home run. <laughs> think about think about that. I mean, you believe that? You want to talk about a baseball artifact? One of my favorite sites um, in 1919, that winter when the Yankees uh, buy Babe Ruth. It's, this is such a little quirk of, of baseball history. If you were to find out where Babe Ruth became a Yankee, in Los Angeles on the 18th hole, right here of the Griffith Park golf course, Ruth had gone to California that winter on his own just to mess around, play some golf and hang out, get away from the turmoil in New York. He heard about this deal. Miller Huggins is sent out on a train to track down Babe Ruth. Huggins goes to the Biltmore Hotel where Ruth would have been staying. They tell him he's playing around the golf. Huggins goes out and finds him by the 18th hole. If you go there today, there's a plaque at the 18th hole marking it as the birth of a curse. 
So Ruth becomes a Yankee on the 18th hole of the Griffith Park golf course, five minutes from Dodger Stadium today. And uh, this to me is th this to me exemplifies roadside baseball. This you would just you, you wouldn't see this one coming normally. You know what I mean? When you think of 1920, Babe Ruth, Miller Huggins, Jacob Rupert, you know, all the players, all these Mount Rushmore style faces that we know from baseball. Um, this was not an East Coast story, at least the signing of the contract wasn't. It was a West Coast story in 1920. So I loved, and again, the fact that there's a, a plaque there marking the birth of the curse, I think is just like the coolest thing. All right, briefly here in Orange County where I live, Walter Johnson moves out as a kid in the 1890s. His dad takes a job working for an oil company. And so little Walter, who's never touched a baseball in his life at about 12 years old in California, is watching the oil workers play fairly organized baseball. Young, strapping guys, burning off steam, oil companies being competitive. Um, one of the workers uh, shows Johnson how to throw a baseball. And he's, Johnson throws it and it's like, wait a minute. Something's going on here. And so Johnson, his baseball legend, is born in the small town of Olinda, today called Brea. Johnson, of course, goes on to his career. And uh, as that career is wrapping up in 1924, after the World Series, he is invited back to play a game, which the town is now called Brea. Town of the Lions Club is, is wants to raise money. There's charity. They invite um, Johnson back. Johnson says, absolutely, I will do you one better. Johnson fronts a team of all-stars and Babe Ruth fronts the other team. Babe Ruth is going to pitch this day as well as kind of a fun Walter Johnson friendship thing to get more tickets sold and raise more money. So it's a very interesting day out of the Brea Bowl. Um, when I was putting the original version of Roadside Baseball together, a gentleman contacted me, uh, uh, John Outland, told me his dad had been 18 years old the day of that game and was at the game and took pictures. There aren't a lot of pictures from that game, hardly any. And this is one of them. That's Babe Ruth at the plate at the Brea Bowl, October 31st, um, 1924. You may not know, the city of Anaheim has the longest running Halloween parade in America. The parade started this day. And what the parade was, October 31st, was the parade of players, the procession getting off the train and then marching down to the field. That tradition maintains today with an, an annual Halloween parade that began on this day when the ball players came to town. There is Walter Johnson pitching right here, courtesy of uh, George Outland. Um, George Outland would go later in life and get his pictures autographed. And here we see a portrait he took of Walter Johnson. We see to GE Outland, best wishes, Walter Johnson. And similarly, Babe Ruth, shot that day by Mr. Allen, also later in life signed that very photo taken in Brea. Um, that's Mr. Outland right here. Uh, he had a photo taken of himself with Sam Crawford that day. Um, you think of these names in a little neighborhood today. And, you know, oh, and there's Babe Ruth pitching. <laughs> the only known photo. Ruth hit uh, two home runs this day, one of which mythically disappears into an, the oil field out beyond right field. Some people are measuring like 600 feet, 60, you know, those crazy numbers that become very inflated. But nevertheless, it was a home run ball that never was discovered. And there is Babe Ruth pitching, which he didn't do a lot of in 1924. And uh, again, a very rare photo, never before seen before Mr. Allen reached out to me. And this is the site today. Home plate would have been right about where this driveway is. I used to do a TV show here called uh, Forgotten Orange County. And we did an episode there. And um, it, was, it was a small crew. It was me, a camera guy, and my co-host, Maria. And uh, I showed her, you know, where home plate was. And that day was garbage day. There was a garbage pail in the driveway. And as we're setting up our camera, the guy, it's like seven in the morning. The guy whose house it is goes, <laughs> he's going out to bring the empty garbage pail in. And I said, let's, let's roll tape and go confront him and let him know like that Babe Ruth hit two home runs from his driveway. <laughs> and so this poor guy looks up and we're coming at him with his camera, right? It's seven of them, he's in a bathrobe and he's like, what the hell? And, and I said, I said, if, I said, listen, don't mind us. You know, we're not, we're not making trouble. You've done nothing wrong. Are you a baseball fan? And he's a huge baseball fan. And I said, do you, are you aware that Babe Ruth hit not one, but two home runs standing in your driveway? And, 
<laughs> and I had the pictures. And I said, and Walter Johnson pitched, we marched off 60 some odd feet, pitched here. And all of a sudden the guy, it, it's amazing the response we captured because he realized that he was living in history. He never knew. He never knew that his house, which is right here, right? Was the home plate was here. The field was out here. This is the only remaining piece. This today is a car auto repair garage. The players got changed in this tin shed and marched down the hill. It is a bowl. They've never regraded it. So you still go downhill and played this game here. And the, the train tracks used to be right here where the players would have gotten off and marched down North Brea Boulevard. So, you know, for me, the real thrill is when you you reveal something to somebody like that guy who, who just didn't know. Because now, A, he'll never think of it the same way again. And he'll pass that story along. The neighborhood will know this. It's how a lot of this stuff lives on. This passing of these bits of information, you know, uh, is to me very important. So when you have somebody like that, that you can confront, maybe not that harshly at seven in the morning, but you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's wonderful when it works out like that. So that's roadside yeah. baseball in a nutshell. Right. That's my fulfilling a dream of going to these places, of, of uncovering stories, of getting to the heart and soul of baseball um, you know, when it when it really mattered to people, when it truly was a national pastime. Now, I referenced something earlier about Tommy Lasorda. About two years ago, I was doing, I'm going to um, show you a book. It's propping this computer up. I'm a big music fan. And I wrote a book with John Oates. Can everybody see that? Well, with John Oates from Hall and & Oates. And uh, John's a big baseball fan. But we were doing an event together, a book signing in Los Angeles. And John says to me, he goes, hey, by the way, a friend of mine's coming tonight. Uh, she's a big baseball fan. You'll love her. You're a baseball guy. You should meet her. I said, great. So his friend is Laura Lasorda, Tommy's daughter. And um, we'd never met. And we met at the thing. And she's great. And I, I actually went and bought a copy of Roadside Baseball, which is in the store. And I said, please bring this to your dad. You know, who doesn't love Tommy Lasorda? <laughs> So she did. And then she called me a couple of weeks later and she said, I want to talk to you about something. She says, do you think she said, my dad at that, at that point, I think he was 90. She goes, he's not getting any younger. And I want somebody to come spend time with him maybe once a week, just to be with him, to record the conversations. Maybe it's a book. She goes, I don't know what it is, but I feel like he has a lot to get off his chest, stories and memories. And um, would you like to, to do that? And I said, you know, are you, like, are you kidding me? Um, yeah, I said it, would be, it would be an absolute uh, supreme honor, you know? So the next week I go to their house. They live in a little house in Fullerton, California, where they have lived for about 60, 62 years. A uh, little modest house. You would never expect this to be where Tom and Lasorda uh, lived. And I went there and um, for two years, I was going there almost every week. And I would sit there and he and I would talk and There'd be constant company coming all the time. Players, nuns, neighbors, just a constant flux of friends and family, and uh, which was always kind of fun and interesting. And then we started going to games together, you know, and that was amazing because we would just be hanging out. And if we were in like the Dodgers, like the suite upstairs, if somebody wanted to see him in another suite, you had to build in like a half an hour because he would never, he would stop for anybody and everybody that would see him and everybody knew who he was. And he had this thing, he truly um, took his role as ambassador very seriously. And that was really a, a big deal to him. This is, um, that's a shot of me going, that's one of the days at the house. That oh. is my, I made the sausage and peppers, my grandmother's recipe right here. I would start cooking once in a while, bring food, and we would just sit there and have these like amazing conversations. And I would bring up like the Astros thing when that went down. You know, I'd go and Tommy, what do you think of the, uh, God damn it, these, I won't even repeat what he said, but, <laughs> but the cheating part of it really cut him deep. That to him was sacrilegious. That was the, like it was a high crime to him, you know? And um, he was an old school guy, you know. I would say little things. Tommy, would you ever order a pitcher to brush somebody back? Well, hell yeah. I mean, what the? Why wouldn't you? You know, he had, it was a, it was a whole different era. But but anyway, you know, he passed away, and um, he had uh, he had started getting ill. He did get to the World Series, which was great. And um, one time, we had been um, 
at a game, one of the last games we went to, and we're sitting down in his two seats by the dugout. Just it's pregame. We're just sitting there, and he's kind of looking off wistfully at the park. He had a little smile on. And I said, Tommy, what are you thinking? Like, what something's going on? What are you thinking? And he says, you know, he goes, you know how old I am, right? And we, he just turned 92. And I said, yeah, we just had a party for you, you know? He says, you know, he goes, I don't know how much long I'm going to be around. He says, but uh, but when I go, I think I want to be buried under that goddamn pitcher's mound. I said, what? He goes, yeah, he goes, what do you think? You think do that? And I said, well, look, if anybody can do it, it's you. I mean, if anybody would have that kind of carte blanche, I can't imagine you wouldn't get it. So, you know, let it, let it be known, you know. So anyway, Tommy passes this past January and Laura is planning the funeral services and, and everything. And she called me one day and she says, you know, she goes, you know, daddy, you know, he loved Dodger Stadium. He loved being out at the mound. I had told her his story and uh, she goes, it's something I want to do. She goes, I want to get him to the mat. One more meeting at the mound. Okay. You, there's rules that when you have a body, there's like rules about what you can do. You can just go to public places and all that. So she made very careful arrangements, uh, very silent arrangements with the organization, with the ballpark, with everything. And the day of the services, about 40 of us or so went to Dodger Stadium in the morning. Nobody knew about this. We had the whole place to ourselves. And uh, they, Bobby Valentine and I think Mike Sosha, everybody wanted to be a pallbearer. And those guys kind of made lineup cards about who was going to like take the cat. He was going to go to the mound once the casket was in. And these guys, these coaches made lineup. God bless these guys. They made lineup cards of like who was going to take him from this point to this point. So everybody could do it. And um, that was one of the images. Oh my. Everybody oh my. had a Tommy uh, jersey on. No press or nothing at this. This is very private. And then we get out there. You can see Eric Harris here. There's Chan Hope Park. There's Bobby V. A um, lot, of, lot of players and coaches who just... Uh, and one by one, everybody went up and spoke their piece. There was a little microphone there. And um, it was... I mean, I've been, I, like a lot of you, we've all had our, our experiences in ballparks, things you don't forget. I mean, for me, game six of the 86 World Series, that's a tough one to beat. The Buckner game, being at that game as a Met fan, yeah. you know, um, this was right up there, though. This was really special. And then as we leave, we're there for a couple hours and it's time to go to the funeral. And we go to the parking lot. And there's three or four L.A. motorcycle cops. And they've got like they speak to everybody. They address everybody. And they say, look, everybody, we're going to need you to line up in tandem. We don't really know what's going on. But uh, unbeknownst to us, they had arranged essentially a presidential escort to Whittier, where the family plot is. And so we all get in our cars, the, the directions given, and we head off, and every freeway was shut down that we were on. I mean, Tommy Lasorda was given a presidential you know, motorcade. And at every exit where the cars were backed up, every cop was saluting. It was like... It hit me in that moment. I got to know him in a way where he was like, he was just this nice old funny guy. I mean, you, you have to get over the fact that this is Tommy Lasorda. This is that guy. And once you go a few times, it's like, you, it just, you know, it's like anything. You get to know somebody. But with the, mo with the motorcade and the escort, then it really hit me that this guy, he was next level. This was somebody who all universally around the world he uh, was recognized and beloved and really, um, really admired by a lot of people. So, so right now we're thinking of what to do with this book. I mean, um, I have hundreds of hours of audio with him, really funny stories and interesting stories and things. And um, so we'll see, I'm still trying to kind of navigate what it needs to be, but beyond anything, it was a, a remarkable experience just getting to know him and the people around him and all that. And so, uh, you know, for me as a fan, it really was, uh, that was life-changing. That, that part of being taken into his world like that at that time in his life was, was and is a really big deal. And I'm still tight with the family and I go visit his wife every couple of weeks. And, you know, I feel like I became an extended part of their family. So anyhow, with that, you guys, that's kind of what I had to talk about today. I'm happy to answer questions or, or take comments or whatever you like. And, First of all, Chris. Oh, that was wonderful. What, what, what passion you have for uh, 
baseball. Un unreal. <laughs> um, before we open up the floor, uh, could you return us to the original screen, first of all? And how do, how do any of the people here want the Polo Grounds or the new revised baseball, uh, roadside baseball? What's the best way to get it? Well, I'm looking, okay, oh, I mean, let me stop my share and share again. I mean, the best way is really, I mean, Amazon is still like, you know, um, let me just get my screen up here. Amazon is still a good way to go. I mean, it's like, you can have the books quickly. You can, um, let me go over here. You can see that. Is that up there now? Um, There's the Polo Grounds. Yeah, so I mean, that's on Amazon. Um, roadside baseball, same thing. I think that's the best way to go. I mean, I'd love to be able to sign them, um, but hopefully we can do that when I come back to New York. We do one of the things in person, but everything's on Amazon, all my baseball books. Um, again, the, the new roadside baseball is something I'm really proud of. That book, it's as exhaustive as a book can be. I mean, honestly, it, I include international sites, uh, places in the Philippines where Babe Ruth played, places in Hawaii, Japan, Australia. I really wanted it to be the definitive baseball travel book uh, that every place baseball brushed up against um, is important. So, but then again, like I said, in about five years or so, there will be places that don't exist today. Something will be torn down. A new marker will be put up. So I'll, I'll do it now. As, look, as long as I'm on the planet, I will be revising that book. I well, promise. the first edition was fabulous, so I'm sure. Well, thanks. Did. I mean, I, I, the, the I, third edition is three is, is three times the size of it. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a substantial book. It really is. I have and, two questions regarding the book. Yeah. One has to do with the Polo Grounds as well. Um, I remember in the Polo Grounds book, your son and... Uh, took a picture by the brush stairway. Have you been back since it's been completed? And this summer, are you planning on going to the Field of Dreams baseball game? Because I know you wrote about that in the book. Great question. I have been back to the staircase right before the pandemic, uh, not long before it. And uh, and I was blown away. You know, I, I love the fact that that's there. I don't have a plan to go to the Field of Dreams thing. Um, Originally, I was thinking about it when it was first being planned, but but that said, I wouldn't rule it out. I think it would be a lot of fun to go. Um, it's a tough ticket, but I may be able to hopefully swing a little something. But that's All right, a good can, thank you, Chris. Uh, we'll go to John and then uh, Steve and then Renee. Sure. Hey, Chris, great book, great presentation. You really were, you showed your your enthusiasm for it. Uh, so I'm going to definitely pick the book up. I. Thank you. Stadiums myself, and I love what you're doing. So keep it up. I appreciate um, it. Man. Thank you. Side note: Field the Dreams game. I'm going to attempt to go myself. So all right, kind of cool. Some uh, some other fun ones. I don't know if you know about. You probably do, but um, some other ones. Obviously, as a Met fan, you know about the the where the ball got by Buckner is in the parking lot. The base. Oh yeah, I've been there. I yeah. I got to tell you, weirdly, I remember going back there for the first time when um when it was a parking lot. I took my kids there and I'm showing them that spot, right? And then I go out to second base where there's a marker. Yeah. And I, I'm telling them, this is where the Beatles set up in 64 or whatever. But as I'm talking, it's this loud drone coming out of the city field. It's like hard for them to even hear me. It's loud, right? It's, it's kind of thunderous and all. It's Paul McCartney sound checking as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> for a show the next day and i thought wow here i am talking beetle history at second base and he's awesome. right in there sound checking which is kind of cool but that yeah i have so been great. there i have my ticket from the game over there um i think of that game all the time all the time very cool another awesome one is uh in cincinnati at the reds museum they have the rose garden it's Love the it. spot where pete rose's single landed to break the record yeah, the Rose Garden, they've done a really good job. I mean, look, Cincinnati is obviously a great baseball town, whether we're talking Crosley or, uh, or Riverfront, they, they get it there. Certain cities really embrace those kinds of places. Um, the Rose Garden, I love that there. I think that is, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. There's a good kind of marker system there that kind of helps you understand where things were. But yeah, Cincinnati is, uh, that, that's a very uh, plaque-friendly stadium town. I yeah. Found. Great Another comment. really good one, by the way, in, is in uh, Atlanta. I think it's still up at where Fulton County used to be. They have the outfield fence right. from where Hank Aaron hit 715. It's and another parking when, lot story. And again, yeah. 
It's an amazing sight. We all remember that clip. Buckner going over the wall, right? Yep. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that piece of wall with the marker on it. I mean, again, when something like that stands and you're all of a sudden you can never watch that clip again and not think I was right there. <laughs> you think of Mazeroski, you know, running the bases at Forbes and you see that home plate. It's like, I was here, you know, that clip was right here. It's crazy. Thanks, John. Awesome. We got Steve, Renee, and then David. Steve? Chris, I, I don't think I've listened to you in almost, it's got to be close to 10 years. You really haven't lost your passion. You've even got, gotten better. Thank um, you. Some of this stuff, that thing with 1934 with that black kid not being able to play. I mean, we, you know, we hear the stories all the time. That one is obviously a new one. Just two points. You meant, you showed us a picture about the museum with the Giants letters. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was an exhibit because I know I was there during the time it was up right field they have what looks like a theater yeah i forgot what they call it and it's a temporary thing because this group is after them to put those letters up somewhere permanently where they're visible we wait those right are not right up in the warehouse. museum there now those are not there now no that's wow. a they changed I that thought, i thought that was permanent display that's crazy well the let you know the it is, uh, steve, was a, uh, steve with all due respect it's rick swig uh, yes, or I should show myself. They, 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 uh, uh, they are on display. Um, it is in a the only place that the Giants show memorabilia, which is under on a, on, a, on the first on the right field side, under the under the stadium. Right. Well, so that's it, what they're, Stanley they're, said. They're in a warehouse, but they want to get them out somewhere. So no, they're, they're, this they're, is all they're, better. Hopefully, it'll happen. Yeah, they're, they're this, museum. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, it's it's a little hidden spot, and I can't. Yeah, but but it's a great little museum. I mean, they've got seats from um, the stadium and of course polo grounds. They had some really cool stuff in there, and it it, it looked permanent. I mean, I was there. Okay, um, I, I could be I could be wrong, but they told us that the letters, uh, the giant right. people told us that the letters were in a warehouse. But it's okay. It's gonna it's gonna happen at some point. Just one more point. There's obviously a passion with Babe Ruth. Have you been in touch with the granddaughter? Who passed away? No, the granddaughter, Linda Ruth Tosetti. No, 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 no. I'm, I was thinking. I was thinking. No, Rudy Linda died. Ruth Tosetti is the one, and she's a New England girl now. Yeah, right, right, right. No, I haven't, but I know. I know you're talking. You about. have contact information for her because I can get it to you. I don't, but I would. I would love it. I would I'll absolutely. Send you, love I'll it. send you there. You still get my emails, right? So I have oh, your yeah, email address. I, after we finish, I'll send you her. Thank email you very address much. And also phone numbers, and I'll copy her on it. Um, I have a guy doing a lecture in a couple of weeks on the babe, and she's going to call in. She's a real spunky one. You, oh, she's wow, like you, a female version of you. Ah. <laughs> she is good. also so featured in the House of Steinbrenner on, uh, it's on the 30 for 30. She's part of the, the House of Steinbrenner one. She goes out and gives her, uh, her grandfather's plaque, a uh, monument, a kiss. I had a really nice time working with Jane Levy on her book, uh, Big Fella. Oh, yeah, we uh, know her well, Jane. Yeah, uh, she was great. I, I, I had uncovered some film of Ruth that nobody had seen, which became part of the book, actually. And, um, yeah, it's always fun to kind of dig up stuff on him. But um, this is family and children. But I appreciate it. Thank you. you. I, I would love that. that. Thank you. All right, Renee, you're, you're up. Right. Renee? Yep. Um, Chris, your enthusiasm... It just really rolled me over. I really love it. I mean, I'm a big baseball fan myself. Early 80s, I was fortunate to go with a bunch of friends uh, to see Comiskey Park, uh, Wrigley Before the Lights, right Tiger in. Stadium. Uh, yeah. uh, it was great. To, I mean, and I do remember uh, yeah. before they renovated Yankee Stadium, right. sitting next to the pillar wow. just awesome. to get a vibe of That's that. Good with that being said, I was also fortunate to go to uh, a Met fan, but uh, um, uh, to go to a lot of home openers for the Mets. And I had a ritual for every opening day. It went for almost 20 years. I would go to the Polo Grounds and that plaque at the Polo Grounds for the Giants and just tap it and just stand there for a while and go, oh, wow, baseball starting up again. This is going to be great. Oh, that's great. That's so that's so amazing. And what I did was I went with a friend of mine, a photographer, took a picture of it, measured it. And I, I have that uh, as a picture with the same size, the way that plaque is. 
Uh, it, it, it's to hear God bless you, man. You know, when you meant you just mentioned something. 19, I, I was a Met fan, but I was a Yankee Stadium fan. Because Yankee Stadium, it was those old photos. And I'd go there and be like, wow, that picture of Babe Ruth, that's the freeze. Like, I, I could line stuff up. So I remember in 1973, when, it, when we learned they were going to be shutting down Yankee Stadium for two years, I begged my father to get tickets. So my family went to that last game. To show you how times have changed, that, the Yankees were awful that year. The place was, was really it was about a third full last game. And when the game was over, <clears throat> people started pulling stuff out. And, and I said to my dad, can you kick a couple of seats out? And my dad, he said to one of the ushers, can we do that? And the ushers said, look. We were told today, as long as nobody gets hurt, have at it. You're giving the you're giving the crew a head start. Take what you can carry. Don't get hurt, and just be careful. So my dad kicks out a bunch of seats, and people have they brought toolkits and were like taking out railings. It was crazy. But I, going back in '75, to me, it wasn't the same. To me, they cut the heart out of that ballpark. It was well, never well, like it was. Well, when, for me, I, went, I mean, I also went to Memorial Park. And oh, you did. Team, Oh yeah, and when I and one of the things I did with, with not only those ballparks, even Yankee Stadium as a kid, was I'm all over the place. Yeah, you yeah. you see my seat. I'm there maybe two innings. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same way. I'm same the, way. And you know what? I went to Fenway Park around that period, and it was really bummed out how I couldn't get to the bleachers unless I bought bleacher tickets because I'm roaming around. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, with that being said, I also used to go into, there's a website I'm sure you're aware of, a stadium page. And, you know, it was great to see parks that I wouldn't go to, can't go to now, um, but I get a good vibe of what, what, what's going on sure. with those ballparks. And I love the dimensions of every ballpark, the stands, the, 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 the little amenities, not necessarily the food, but just the way the, the, the seats are laid out and the different perspectives you get watching a game. You talk about a, a, a places that had baseball uh, uh, um, history, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, but the Canyon of Heroes, there are markers on those streets. I mean, yeah. I went last year, I had to go you know, to a dental appointment and couldn't wait to get to the 1954 New York Giants strip. I mean, it, it's got every parade that ever went through Canyon Heroes. So to see the Giants, the Mets, I mean, it was great to see. I mean. Uh, it's just it, it, to see that type of uh, uh, stamp on history laid there. I mean, know, look, I, beat it. I try and cover in roadside baseball from the sublime to the ridiculous and everything in between. We all knew, I remember when I learned, like, we all see Pride of the Yankees, right? We all know the story. Gary pulls himself out of the line out in Detroit all that last game is essentially Detroit. A lot of people don't realize that a few weeks later, after he's done with, when he's removed, he's not in the lineup anymore. The Yankees have a mid season exhibition scheduled against one of their minor league teams in Kansas city. They used to play those in the middle of the season. Gehrig knew that the fans, they had sold tickets based on him being there. He comes out and plays three and that's his last appearance municipals uh field in kansas city that's where he plays his last game that's where he goes to the train station after and takes a train to minneapolis to the mayo clinic so you learn about that and all of a sudden that field which already has a great amount of history and it's a park it's a park today which is nice um that's where he that was the last place he suited up one other thing i want to call out that i didn't mention um lane field that i showed you in san diego Two very quick stories and I'll shut up, but I, I think you'll enjoy these. Um, I was doing a book event a couple of years ago and a woman says to me, you got to meet my dad. You got to meet my dad. He was the bat kid for the Padres, Pacific Coast League. He was a high school phenom in San Diego. He gets a job, wins an essay contest, becomes a bat boy. So I meet him and uh, he's great. And he tells me this story. In fact, we're working currently on a TV version of Roadside Baseball. One of the stories we shot, I brought him back to the site to tell the story where it happened. What happened was, he's the bat kid. He's 15 years old, loves baseball. He's so good they have him back a second season in like 51, 52-ish. Lefty O'Doul is managing the Coast League Padres that year. 
And he says, Lefty O'Doul is a son of a bitch. He's very tough on the bad kids, um, a real, real dictator. And O'Doul pulls, pulls this guy aside one day, Bud, and he says, look, a friend of mine is coming to the game today, all right? You're not to bother him, all right? It's Joe DiMaggio. And you're not to look at him. You're not to, he's, you don't embarrass me. You are the bat boy, all right? You leave. And, and Bud says to me, this is my hero. Like you couldn't have said two words that would have meant more to me than Joe DiMaggio. And this guy's giving me the dugout, the whole freaking game. And I can't do anything, right? So Bud says he goes through the game and it's killing him. He sees it. at one point, DiMaggio, O'Doul is brought in a box of baseballs and DiMaggio signing them for people that they're going to be giving away later. And these balls are being lined up in the dugout. This poor kid, this is happening before his eyes, right? And at the end of the game, Bud says, you know what? In my head, I say, screw it. If it gets me fired, I don't give a shit. Excuse me. I'm going to go introduce myself to Joe DiMaggio. I'm not going to let this moment get away. So, so Bud, O'Doul's kind of preoccupied. Bud senses his moment, moves in, and he says, DiMaggio couldn't be any nicer. He says, he says you know, my boss left. He, DiMaggio says, don't, don't worry about it. You want me to sign a baseball for you? It's like... Samaggio signs ball for him, gives to the kid. Bud's walking away. Now we're sitting, as he's telling me this on camera, where the dugout was. This happened right where we were. This is the whole roadside baseball thing. And he's just walking away. Samaggio, he says, hey, come here, come here. He says, look, he goes, you know, my, my wife hates baseball. She's been in the car the whole time, just outside the park. You want me to have her sign uh, your ball for you too? It's Marilyn Monroe sitting in the car. And Bud says, nah. He knows who it is. He says, Mr. DiMaggio, I, I, I would not sully this ball with any other signature. This is really, this is like sacred. So I, I no, thank you, but no. He passes up. Now, I don't know if you know how rare those balls are. They're very rare. Bud's son goes on to play for the San Diego Padres later on. This is a baseball story with so many great moving parts, you know. Um, but the other piece at that ballpark is, Right before Jackie Robinson, you may know this, but may not know where it took place. Before Branch Rickey really kind of inserts him into the lineup, some things, Branch Rickey wants to have photos of Robinson. It's kind of weird, but it kind of makes sense, I guess, given the time, uh, in a uniform on a field by himself, kind of going through drills to show people this guy's a real ball player. So Branch Rickey gets a photographer from Look, the three of them. Grant Tricky, the photographer, and Jackie Robinson go to Lane Field. They have the place to themselves. You can look the photos up of Jackie Robinson at Lane Field being photographed. So he has photos to say to people, he, look, he's a real, don't worry about it. He's a real ball player. He looks the part, he is the part, he is that guy. But he felt he needed to have this sort of PR proof slash evidence to make his case to help promote Robinson as a ball player. When I go to Lane Field today, I think of that coupled with Ted Williams starting there, coupled with Bud <laughs> foregoing a Marilyn Monroe, Joe DiMaggio autograph. And all of a sudden it's like that field has a little bit of everything. It's everything. It's, it's social justice, it's celebrity, it's baseball, it's hall of fame, it's everything. Those are the places for me that are like the roadside base, the true shrines where anything is possible. I love Lane Field. I really, that one to me is really special. So. <laughs> All right, David, you're up. Okay, uh, just a, a few comments. Uh, number one, I was at that last game that you mentioned before at Yankee Stadium, uh, September 73. Exactly we were both how there, you described how cool. it. Yep, which was quite an experience. Um, also want to say uh, thumbs up on a fantastic job. I really enjoyed the John Oates book and also oh, thank as you. a full Utopia fan. Thank you for your wonderful podcast interviews you've done with Todd Rundgren and Willie oh, Wilcox, the, best. the absolute best, thank you. So uh, really uh, fantastic with that. My question is this, the Los Angeles Angels, now the uh, LA Angels of Anaheim, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> started out at Wrigley Field prior to sharing Dodger Stadium before moving to Anaheim. Right. What was that stadium like and what is there right now? And are, are there any markers of that stadium? Great question. Before we, before I answer you, I want to show you one of my rarest and most favorite artifacts. That is a seat from Wrigley Field right there. There you go. Wow. Now Wrigley Field 
interestingly, was called Wrigley Field before the Chicago version, the Wigman Park. Wrigley Field was called that a year before. William Wrigley, who owned the Cubs, um, also owned Catalina Island. So the Cubs for 30 years trained on Catalina Island, 1920 to 1950. The field is still out there. He builds, um, you know, uh, Wrigley Field. It's in South Central LA, 10 minutes from the Coliseum. Um, the reason we know Wrigley Field in a lot of ways is it was, Hollywood loved it because you could shoot there all year, Pride of the Yankees. They would redress Wrigley Field as Yankee Stadium, Sportsman's Park. That's Wrigley Field. In many movies, Home Run Derby, the, t- the TV show, was shot at Wrigley Field. Primarily two reasons. One, the weather in California. But two, it was proportionally exact. The gaps, everything was synchronous. It was the same distances throughout the park down the line everything was symmetrical so they didn't they felt like batters didn't have an advantage right or lefty so wrigley field somehow after the angels play there their first season maris hits Weird. one of his home runs season at wrigley field um there's a lot of history there uh steve bilko um you know a lot of fun la pacific coast league angels teams um the at that point of course the rivalry was the hollywood stars in terms of Pacific Coast League, playing up at Gilmore Field of the Farmer's Market. If you didn't know, um, uh, Robert Cobb owned the Hollywood Stars. He also owned the Brown Derby Restaurant in L.A. One night, it's late at night, he goes in the kitchen, he's hungry. He, he Cobb instruct, salad. Cobb salad. He instructs his crew to throw leftovers into a bowl. He'd eat whatever <laughs> it was. That be, That's the birth of the Cobb salad. But back to Wrigley, um, one of the last events there was the show by Alice Cooper and Frank Zappa in 1969. I asked Frank, now Frank uh, Cooper is a huge baseball guy. And he and I talked about this and he remembered it very well. He's like, I'm doing this show thinking about the baseball that took place there. So it was torn down in late 69. If you go there today, there is a um, mental health facility that's there. No marker, no nothing. But on the leading edge of the property, the Dodgers have a youth field that they've paid for there that does say former set of Wrigley Field. Um, If you remember the actor Fred Willard, you know him? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fred and I were, I met Fred about 30 years ago at a party and we found out that we both had this thing about baseball and about standing in places where stuff happened. He's worse. You think I'm into this stuff? (laughs) Fred put me to shame. And he and I used to spend our weekends doing stuff like this. And one time, this this isn't that funny, but we go to Wrigley Field. You had to kind of break in. It's a mental health facility. So we sort of slipped in. Fred was very good at that. And uh, we're out there and these guards come out. What are you doing here? You know, we have books and stuff. And we said, you know, there was a baseball field. They thought we, there were were people (laughs) sitting and looking at us through the windows. I'm sure thinking these were the next people to be admitted you know you guys <laughs> claiming there was bait oh, my friend fred's like yeah dimaggio played right here and why do you the yankees were here da, da, da. and it was it was so funny but oh, uh, funny. Ridley was a gorgeous park um never had lights it was uh kennesaw mountain landis was there for the very first game and i think it opened in 20 uh-huh. uh, 21 22 and uh for years, it was a memorial stadium, and so there was a plaque honoring soldiers. Today, the plaque is on Catalina Island mm-hmm. on a boulder where the field used to be. So there is some continuum there that okay. gets you to Wrigley Field. Thanks a lot. All right, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to go to Mars and Jock. Uh, Chris, you mentioned Yankee Stadium as, you know, a cathedral, and you had that picture of where the stadium was Um today you know there's a field there i don't know i just where the new field is without that courthouse behind it to me it's just it's just not the same i I, totally agree it's just the courthouse it's just the courthouse was yankee stadium they would always film with a home run you'd soar it soaring up toward the courthouse it's not the same no those pictures of lou gehrig that day that for me that's where the courthouse is like a character in the photo. I mean, it's like it's so prominent. Right. And different, yeah, I always notice as a kid learning about depth of field lenses, how in some pictures it looks closer. So it's kind of weird. Other pictures, it was really far away. I remember going to see it in person. It's like, wait a minute, why is it so far out there? But 
you know, I remember as a kid, the first time I went to Yankee Stadium in like 71, they had those telephones on one of the mid levels where you could pick it up and you could hear Babe Ruth talking. It was Babe Ruth, Luke Gehrig, and one other one. But by the early 70s, the tape was so stretched. Like it was like a, it was like playing a 45 record out there. It was like, oh, good. My name is Babe. And they, they, but they kept it there for decades, which I thought was amazing. Um, I, um, you, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but when I was doing one of those books, I learned that the guy that wrote Take Me Out to the Ball Game, Jack Norworth, uh, was, was buried in Orange County. So, I mean, long story short, there's a marker there today that I had placed because I felt it was really, I went, I was, went there hoping there'd be some ornate marker, the guy that wrote the third most popular song in American history um, behind the national anthem and happy birthday. And there was like nothing, you could barely read his name on the thing. And uh, I tried, I raised money for a marker, but by state law, you, he is no next of kin, Jack Norworth. So by state law, you can't alter someone's grapes. So I, this is a, this is a much longer story, but the upshot was, I said to the lady at the cemetery, well, what's the nearest closest plot, you know? And she goes and gets like a map and it's a hundred feet away or something like that. And she says, uh, and I said, if I buy this, I had the money to buy it. We'd raised about almost $10,000. And uh, so buy it and then some. And uh I said, if I buy it, can I do whatever I want with it? And she says, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was so sick of me at this point. And I said, if I want to put a marker here that says Jack Norworth isn't here, he's like over there. <laughs> you know, if you turn around and walk a hundred paces, you'll find him. Could I do that? And she says, she looked it up and she's like, you know what I think she was, we have rules for you. You can't use profane language, whatever. But she goes, I think you're okay. Like there's nothing, nothing is in the rules that would preclude you. So if, so if you go there today, um, there's a marker, a whole, it was like a big tombstone, beautiful black granite thing that I wrote the story on. Um, Raleigh Fingers and I hosted the unveiling in 2010 and it's, uh, that's there today. So that was kind of a cool project as well. Nice. One other thing, uh, Todd Rundgren, long overdue. Hall of Fame? Yes. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Todd, pff, Todd <laughs> should have been in the free. Yeah. Uh, look, Todd Rundgren is deeply misunderstood. He doesn't do himself any favors. I mean, Todd doesn't make it easy. Um, he's a bit difficult, but, but in terms of resume and pedigree, pff, hell yeah. <laughs> Todd is as good as it gets. He, he's as talented as you can be. In terms of musicianship, songwriting, singing, uh, I think for his generation, he's as good as anybody. I think, as I stated before, Chris is really a renaissance man, does everything and not, not only baseball. So, Mars, you're up. I have three uh, anecdotal stories uh, for you. Uh, my uh, great uncle produced Home Run Derby, Lou ah. Breslow. Ah. <laughs> so, so, so there's, there's one. Oh, my and, God. And I, I heard a rumor that they're going to put a graveyard where Candlestick Park was because it's where old ball players get blown away. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the third the third one was uh, in 2017. I went to uh, Pittsburgh with the uh, Giants vacation group. The the most beautiful ballpark because of the views. Oh, and God. we went to uh, the Mellon Institute where home plate is in you know the library under glass. And they have the 436 foot marker. That was just fabulous. It's in a beautiful part of Pittsburgh, too. Yeah, it really is. It's a lovely area. It's not <laughs> far. You can go where Honus Wagner's home was. And Roadside, I've got a lot of Pittsburgh sites in there. Yeah, obviously, great baseball town. Um, you know, I love Honus Wagner. It's always fun to track down stuff of his. But, you know, to your point, um, wait, the first, your first anecdote about Home Run Derby. If you watch that show today, there is something so incredible about when the announcer is sitting in the dugout, having that conversation like with Willie Mays while Mickey Mantle is back. And yeah. it, all you hear is the sound of bat on ball. It's uh -huh. the most amazing. There's no, no noise except the little conversation, the whispered conversation and that sound of the bat on ball. I, 
I am I love that show. I wish it had been more than one season. Um, but uh, you think Mark it was guy died, boy. Mark Scott, the announcer, died. Yeah, that was what did it, right? He died. And he was kind of spearheading it. And um, Tommy was sort of loved that. We talked about that show. It was something he really uh, had good memories of. Dude, did you want to love, the sort of loved the story about Babe Ruth becoming a Yankee in L.A. He would pull people over and say, tell that goddamn story about Babe Ruth. Like, he would make me hold, no matter who was in the room, I had to always tell that story. He just, That to him was just like, he couldn't fathom that that, that had happened. It's kind of funny. Dave, go ahead quickly. Yeah, uh, Chris, the son of the Home Run Derby producer, who's now in his middle 80s, lives in my community, Larry Breslau. Really? Actor, Willie Mays actually, when he was younger in high school, actually gave him a Willie Mays glove. And that producer also did, I'm not sure if you know, in the middle 30s, he did four Babe Ruth shorts. That was Lou Breslau. Um, wow. You know that you get you anyways, know the, bat, the bat somehow is missing. The the family had a Babe Ruth bat somehow it's missing. But oh anyway, my goodness, yeah, small right, we got great it. subject. Thank you. I love I love learn. I love hearing stuff like this. And this is the only kind of group where you'll get this kind of feedback right, and we, anecdotal stories. This was all John, Giants fans. John, Bill, and then Perry. John, yes, Gary. Uh, sorry. Um, one of the cool things that I like about these stadiums is just the wacky sort of stories that go into building them, like Griffith Stadium and how there's a house that they just built around. <laughs> it's fantastic because the guy wouldn't sell if I understand it's it correctly. Same thing down in Georgia where the crackers put where there was the tree, you know, certain. I mean, look, the monuments, I mean, I admit the monuments in Centerfield Old Yankee Stadium, that to me was the most amazing thing. They were on the field. Yeah. <laughs> Or even modern day, the hill that used to be at Minute Maid. Which was dangerous. I mean, honestly, I, I liked it at first, but I thought now they're getting a little bit crazy. I mean, Crosley they're trying Johnson. to sort of make those things up. Whereas like with Crosley, there was a natural incline in left mm -hmm. field. They just, it was too expensive to grade to get through the, the granite. So they left it. I like when it was sort of a natural phenomenon that they kind of worked around a house or a tree or something like that. Bill, go ahead. My uh, list of books to uh, read has now gotten one deeper, but yours is going to the top of the list as soon uh. as you buy it, because I am a ballpark junkie. Uh, I will add one thing about Lane. It is the only stadium that was taken down while it was in existence, piece by piece by piece. Every about every other year, they would come in and condemn some of the bleachers because of the termites. Termites, right? The termites, and, and they had to, they slowly, the, the size kept getting smaller and smaller. I wish you had shown some more pictures of my favorite ballpark. It's not Candlestick or the Polo Grounds, believe it or not. Yeah. But yet, Scheib, AKA uh, um, uh, Connie Mack Stadium. Um, July 4th of 72, uh, m one of my friends who uh, recently retired as a doctor, he never told his patients that he snuck into uh, uh, Sh into Shive Park. We stole four seats out of there on July 4th, 1972 and brought them home on the subway. <laughs> I mean, it was like, how many seats you want? We, we could have had five. We only took four, thankfully, because four, you, you know, subways you got the turnstiles and oh, wow. you can only get so much up and down. We got four in there and he's got a photo of me climbing a ladder. I'm about 30 feet up the scoreboard, you, up the scoreboard. And uh, you know, that day will ride in my memory forever. You know, I don't have it here, but for giant fans about 20, 25 years ago, a guy says to me, just look, um, I have a friend in San Francisco. His dad used to own a construction company that took down, in part, Seal Stadium. Oh, yeah. He said the hard, the bleachers was really quality hardwood. And his son used a lot of bleacher bench for the floors in his house, his big house in the Bay Area. He says, I wrote him about you and told him what a freak you are about stadiums. About two days later, 
I don't, it's in storage now. I get a strip of bleacher bench that's got about nine seats on it. It's one of my favorite pieces. Because Seal Stadium to me, that's another one kind of like the Polo Grounds. There is something to me so inherently special about that park. Never went there, of course, but something about it. I remember as a kid, there was a TV show like Mannix or something that was shot at Seal Stadium. And you got really nice views of it. And I thought, wow, what a cool looking ballpark. The Hams Brewery, that thing you saw by home play. It had a lot of personality. And I love going there today and kind of marching off where things would have been. And certain parks that you never went to, they kind of get in your system and, and they don't go away. Seals is definitely one of those for me. One final question. Do you have anything in your book about the oldest continuously used ballpark in America? The Warren Rhode Island Park in Bisbee. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. good. I was there on my 60th birthday. I made my wife take me there, and she took the photos of me at Warren. I mean, Listen, like I said, I that, stuff like that. I, I will tell you the third edition of that book. I was looking at it the other night, and I forgot how exhaustive it is. It really, it, it's bordering obsession. I, I just was feeling something where it's like everything has got to be in here and um and i really went deep on it and uh i'm super proud of it i mean i remember when it first came out sporting news who published the first edition of it said you know what we sent a copy to ken burns and he asked if he could put a blurb on the back of it and for all the i, I was 11 when i had that first thought but ken burns his words on the back he oh, yeah. got it I remember reading his words. It's like, he totally understands. I haven't been able to even describe myself what this all means, but in two or three sentences, he had it figured out. He had it figured out. And I met him at the All-Star Game in Pittsburgh in like 93, 94, 90, no, 95, I think. And uh, it was like a party. And I got to go to him and say, you know, I, I started work on it then. And, and, and then I met him at 10 years later, rather. And he was so generous and gracious. And he really... He got it. I mean, he um, he likes this stuff a lot as well. And uh, again, we're all kind of kindred spirits here. This this your kind of baseball fans that you are 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 you know you grew up with it. You embrace it. You embrace the emotional part of it as well. It isn't just it is it isn't just a stats group. It's just memories and stories yeah. and stats are part of it. I know. But there's, uh, you know, the passion that you all feel. I could tell from your reactions while I was talking. You get this stuff. You want, you're, we're kindred like that. So I really appreciate A, the chance to talk to you, and B, the fact that you exist, that there's this group of people that, um, that really embraces, I think, the, the most. The third people. edition is the last edition I'm supposed to get, right? Third? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third is the most third recent. Third is the most recent. Okay, thank you. Harry Barber. Hey, Gary. Thanks. Hey Hi, Chris. Hey, Perry. So I just would like to reiterate how much I appreciate your book. I'm something of a road warrior since I've been umpiring amateur baseball primarily oh. for 41 years. Oh, my God. And there is something so romantic to me about even yeah. the most modest, dustiest little ball field that I work on, you know, with teenagers or kids or adults that think that they're one base hit away from a major league contract. Um, so I really appreciate your chronicling all of those wonderful ballparks. Thank you so uh, much. And thank you for being part of the game. Oh, you're, yeah. part, you're part of history. <laughs> so I'm about to visit a Polar Park where the Woo Sox play now. And I spent a lot of my childhood up in um, Webster, Massachusetts, which is not far from Worcester. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, I just want to ask you one question. Yeah. If I said the name Moogie Klingman to you, would that ring a bell? I knew Moogie well. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We'll have to talk about He He's an old boyfriend of mine. And Moogie? I lived with him in the studio the summer of 1970. Wait a minute, wait, the secret sound? Yes, yeah. You I, were at the secret sound? When Rundgren was producing War Babies with Hall. Oh, you're, and you're, 
And, and would you believe me if I told you that every single day they were all stoned out of their minds on LSD? Oh, I believe it. <laughs> but they put out that great, I mean, I think it was a great album. A lot of I people say it was I love wonderful. War Babies. I mean, while you were at the Secret Sound is a mythical studio. I'm all I, I, I sure built yeah, it. 23rd Street and 7th yeah. Avenue. Yep. I was there. Oh, Perry, I would love to stay in touch with you. Um, okay. Hey, Gary, if you want, you can share my email with anybody here in the group. Absolutely. I, mean, I will take care of that. Please don't hesitate. Yeah, I would love to have Moogie. Moogie was amazing. He, he, was, um, he finally he got good. his wish of a utopia reunion yeah. at the end, thank God. And Todd was very gracious about it. And um, wow. I once asked Daryl. Daryl Hall is not a sports guy at all, but he grew up loving donkey baseball. Like That was his thing as a kid. Um, in, outside of Philadelphia, where they would play on mules. Um, that's his bit. But John is a I've good baseball I've never heard guy. of that. Donkey baseball. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe you were at the Secret Sound. I'm going to tell John Oates when I talk to him tomorrow that oh, somebody was there too. for the recording of War Babies. Oh, well, I listen, you, he might why didn't you take me. pictures? He might remember me because I got to know them and I also wound up opening for them at several colleges around the Northeast because I'm a reformed musician. I used to um, open act, open shows for some fairly well-known musicians. Oh my God, what an amazing know. story. What an incredible story, Barry. <laughs> yeah, I have a very sordid past. So. <laughs> incredible. This is, man, Gary, why do we wait so long to do this? I could find and you more, and more best. importantly, when can we do it again? <laughs> I could supply you with anything you need. Um, you have time for a couple more questions, or sure, absolutely. Renee, go ahead. Um, the newer ballparks. What's your take of them? Uh, their character. Uh, do you have a favorite? Does one stand out and then the other, and then why? It's a good question. Um. If anybody had told me that in 2021, we would sit here and say that Dodger Stadium was the fourth oldest ballpark in the major league, you know, third oldest ballpark, and that Dodger Stadium, uh, Angel Stadium was the fourth, and that Oakland was the fifth, you know, if you had told me back that in the early 1980s or late 70s, it, I, I wouldn't have believed it, you know. That said, there's obviously been a renaissance of new parks. I... I got to tell you, I, I do think there are some great parks. Um, I think Petco, I like Petco in San Diego. I love the Giant Stadium. I really do. I think it's a beautiful park. Um, for me, I mean, Pittsburgh, I think it's tied. I love Pittsburgh. But for me, there is still something about Camden Yard. I love Camden. Now, look, part of it is the Babe Ruth DNA that, that we get with, you know, the Ruth birthplace and all that. But you want to know, I, I really think, because without Camden, I'm not sure we would have had the integrity that we've had in a lot of other parks. Camden set a standard that I think was really important. Incorporating the warehouse. That kind of thinking was, was very, very uh, breakthrough. It really was. A lot was. of that was Janet Marie Smith. Absolutely, she absolutely. Was involved with both Camden and the renovation of, of Fenway. Totally. There, and... Um, so, but, but, but Renee, I want to tell you something, and God's honest truth, there, I, sort of echoing Perry just said, there is not a ballpark that doesn't delight me. I mean, I go to Oakland, which everybody gets down on. I love that park. It's not fancy, it, but it wasn't designed for that. It's a blue collar park, um, but it's a baseball field. You know what I mean? I've it never been in the a fan base. Pardon? It fits the fan base. It, it totally reflects the culture, the local culture. So it's legitimate. It's authentic. So, I mean, ballparks to me, they're just, um, they're like dogs in a sense. I like some dogs more than others, but I'm a dog person. There's no dog I don't like, you know? And, and ballparks, there's nothing like, it's the cliche. We all feel it. When you first see the green, I don't care where I am. I really don't. Especially um, over the day, forget it. I mean, it's... I don't care how many times I've been there, opening day, it's like, is this a new ballpark? The smell, especially great weather, wow. No, and, and I have to tell you, when we had Lasorda, when we had Dodger Stadium to ourselves, that was surreal to me because we could just walk off every spot and click, through, and I could see the players doing it too, kind of clicking off the images of, you know, things that took place there. And, and it was like, 
it was surreal just being able to wander and, and be there and have all those players there and players there the players were chatty about their experiences there so you could you could grab a garvey you could grab a charlie huff and talk about what was the sort of like and they would they would reflect on things it was very participatory very open and it really brought a lot of those stories to life so i mean camden and, and pittsburgh i love um i uh but again i I, there's nothing, you put me in any ballpark and I'm happy. I really am. You know, uh, Dodger Stadium, it took me a while to sort of get it. Part of it has to do with my par- impatience with parking and traffic. It was getting out of there. As a, but, um, but I like Dodger Stadium, uh, finally. Um, the one thing I don't like, I'll be honest with you, I don't like the, the, um, what's happened to spring training. I think spring training has become overdeveloped. And I think they have surgically removed the charm of what spring training used to be by making it kind of a normal baseball, a 30 day season. Um, I like the smaller, weirder fields, you know, that weren't like little mini shrunk down major league parks. I know what they're doing. I, I, I get it, but I much preferred the more casual atmospheres and uh, the, you know, the parks that were, uh, there used to be a lot of spring training parks where Babe Ruth played, you know, and those are all gone for the most part. So spring training to me, they've lost a little bit of what used to make. I went for like 12 years in a row, my son, and it was like, it's still great, but I kind of miss the simpler days before it was so developed. And before there was like VIP scene, all that stuff, they've just mimicked the MLB experience. And again, I understand it, but that to me has been a little, I mean, that said, there are some cool parks, the Cubs park, uh, in what city is it in Mesa? Mesa. 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 There's some really nice parks there where the Angels play. Uh, at Tempe, I liked a lot. But uh, but again, as long as there's a dime in there and those sounds are happening, I'm hard pressed to be too critical of any ballpark. One really last fun. thing uh, between your conversation between you and Perry, I guess there's only 100 people in the world. I tell you what, that's really, you're right, man. It's if that, world. if if that many. When Perry said the name Moogie Klingman, Moogie Klingman, it was kind of weird because David, we have this Rundgren was already introduced in the conversation. And now we have Moogie, who was uh, also a very talented keyboard player. Uh, Chris, I, Chris, I don't think um, a lot of people actually know what you do other than being an author. I mean, I see you on TV all the time. I know of a show on ESPN, Peyton's Place, where Peyton Manning goes to places. Why isn't your book considered for a series on, you know, yeah. Finding well, well like right that. now we're talking to PBS about a TV version of Roadside Baseball. Oh, that's great. And, and it's feeling good. They've, they're raising money and they've, they've approved it. They really like it. And so that's my, if I can do one thing before it's all over, it would be that. It would be a TV version of Roadside Baseball only because I believe in the power of the stories and, and not just the major league stories. That story about those kids, that American Legion team and the black kid that they stood up for, that's as good a, that's as good a baseball story as anything involving Mickey Mantle, Ted Wood, anybody. That's as good a story. And it's not jaded with the league. You know, I will tell you, when I had that marker placed, for the guy that wrote Take Me Into the Ball Game, the, the All Star Game was in Anaheim that week that we had the marker unveiled. And I wanted to have um, a player or two come over and be part of our unveiling. It was all. I didn't know how to go about it. So the, I, I, Joe Buck wrote the foreword to Roadside Baseball. And since he did that, he and I have always had kind of a little email thing going, a little baseball once in a while, shoot each other little stories. So I had his, I wrote him and I said, Look, man, I, is there any way we could get somebody out here? Um, and he goes, look, he goes, I, it's a brilliant idea. He goes, but I doubt it'll happen. Major League Baseball is going to want a lot of money to bring somebody over. And I said, wait a minute, maybe I'm not explaining it right. I said, we don't want anything. I said, to the contrary, we're having a videotape. We'll give you a package of the footage. How cool would it be during the seventh inning and stretch of the All-Star game before you play take me to the ball game cut away to what happened two days before of us honoring a guy at, at a cemetery you can see from angel stadium joe says i love it he gives me a couple of names 
I hit a dead end every time. Major League Baseball, no, it's not a sponsorship opportunity, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I'm losing my interest for the game at that point. I interviewed Raleigh Fingers about a month before for an article. And I thought, what the hell? I called him and I said, are you going to be in Anaheim for the game? He goes, yeah, I'm coming, old timers thing. And I said, uh, I said, I need a guy just to come help me do this. And he goes, what time and where? And I said, can you do that? I said, because I spoke to Major League Baseball. I won't use the language he used to basically reiterate, I'll do whatever the hell I want. Tell me what time and where. He showed up, Raleigh Fingers. Um, he was amazing. I mean, he he emceed it with me. I think his pictures in the book, I believe, of, the, of us doing that. And he was so cool. Like he he got it. And he I figured he looked like an old-time player, like it kind of fit having him there for that ceremony, you know, and uh, Cracker Jack sent, we had like 400 people there. Cracker Jack sent like boxes of Cracker, it was, it was really cool. Major League Baseball should have bent over backwards to incorporate that. It wouldn't have cost them a penny. We were giving it to them. That's all we wanted to do. You know, it got great press. They still wouldn't pick up on it. And that, that for me began my almost disassociation with the modern game. That left such a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, Mike Trout helped me, <laughs> helped bring me back as an Angel fan. Uh, that helped me get over a lot of my uh, just really distaste for, for what that process was like. I mean, I, we couldn't get anybody interested in that. Well, Chris, I, I think um, many of the people on board tonight had no idea who you are. And now I think you are etched very much in their minds uh, with everything you have accomplished and will accomplish. Well, I think we you're, all, you're, too, you're too kind. Look, you're all a great round of applause to Chris Epton. Chris, you know, you're always uh, welcome back here and to hop on board whenever, you know, a guest. In you know, I'm going to I'm going to start. I've been woefully remiss when it comes to that. If you would like Eric, at a certain point, I would love to do. Um, I have a different presentation, baseball, just about Orange County. And it's a it's a really wonderful story. It gets you. Honus Wagner, Baby Satchel Page, all these people, but there are some other really great stories about Mexican leagues and 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 and, and some really cool stuff. So if you ever want, I would be happy to come back. Honored. There's no doubt about that, and there's no doubt that when PBS does the right thing and does your uh, book, yeah. that you come back and talk about that as well. Well, listen, so, yeah. anytime. <laughs> Um, I will become, I would love to, if, if it's possible to hang in your group here, when you all do this, I would love to do this if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and this was, look, I, I want to thank you all, you guys, women, everybody here. Thank you for, uh, for doing what you do. You, this is to me, the heart and soul of baseball, you guys getting together and uh, you know, again, Harry, your story is your, your role in the game. That, that's what matters to me. You know, these these kinds of moments are what make me love the game. And Chris, so Chris you, you will get, you will get you. Barry's phone number. Don't worry. All right, good. Chris, I sent you the Babe Ruth granddaughter I information, email, and the two phone numbers. You have that. If you're ever back in Arizona, if you remember oh, well, the last time you sold three books and you sold out, yeah. I can't guarantee that would happen. If you're in Arizona, please come and bring a bunch well, of books look, and stuff whatever let, let's stay in touch let's as we're getting back Absolutely. into the world let's plan something in person if we can i would love um to do this i want to come back and do the polo grounds walking tour when when does that happen how does that happen peter go ahead tell him peter please tell me what you're doing you gotta you gotta take uh, unmute unmute, unmute. Peter. okay can you hear me yes what would you like to know well, how often do you do it? As often as somebody <laughs> expresses an interest, which, which is just about never. <laughs> I'm about history. Well, I'd like to go again. I, I, I do go. not know anything about marketing myself or advertising or, any, or anything else. I'm not doing this for the money. I do this because I love it. And because I love it, I don't want to have anything to do with convincing people to come or anything else. I do have a nice website, by the way. But if somebody says they're interested, I'm there. What's and the website? Do, What's and website? don't tell anybody. Yeah. I'm serious. What is the website? I, I want to know a little about them. Most of the time, it's somebody who's about 19 years old. They're in college. I don't charge them anything. 
I just do this because I love it. So if you're interested, be in touch. What is the website? NewYorkDynamic.com. By the way, there are lots of baseball photos on there with explanations. There's a a gallery page. And if you go to that page with your cursor, it'll say New York City and baseball. Go to baseball. There are 150 photos. Most of them are photos that, to me, were... Uh, that I hadn't seen before or not very often. Well, here's the deal. I'm coming back in August for my son's birthday. We would love to do this. So I promise to be in touch. And if anybody else wants to join us, let's come do this, please. Just go to, it's newyorkdynamic.com. I can give you my email address if you'd like it. What is it? It's just my name. You can see it right there. Peter Laskowitz, you see how it's spelled? Peter Laskowitz at earthlink.net. All right. Charlie and I would love to do this. I promise to be in touch. We will make arrangements. Okay. I'd be happy to. I did want to ask, can I, I'm sorry, I don't want to take up your time. No, no, no. When you were talking about the, the Giants sign at the Giants Museum, you said that you thought that that sign came from the home plate end of the polo grounds. But I'm almost certain it came out of I don't know how to click on my, com- I'm not good with computers. I don't know how to click on this thing to show you the photos of what I'm convinced are those letters, because they're different, of the those out- letters think it was behind on the, the, the clubhouse, yeah. behind the clubhouse. I agree with you. The Harlem no, I agree with you. That was an older photo. I totally agree with you. The vault is the name of the museum there. When right. you look at those photos, I totally agree with you. So and you're familiar was, with it. At the curator, I was writing an article about it. The curator wasn't too sure herself. And I started looking at photos and I think you're right. I think it was the clubhouse center field um, out there. I do. Um, They are different. They are different. So, but worth seeing if you get a chance, absolutely worth seeing. And and again, Peter will be on in uh, three weeks to do his presentation. Oh, well, I'm not missing that. I I look, I'm gonna be joining. I wanna be part of this. I want to so, yeah, give everybody first, a little warning. I I love baseball. I love what the Giants mean to New York and to San Francisco. This presentation is is basically my this chapter of the book. We can change it if you want. But I'm planning for this presentation in three weeks to be uh, a small portion of this chapter of a book I'm writing. And the topic of the book is the connections between the history and culture of baseball with that of New York. For example, oh. why does baseball have foul lines? How did the topography of Manhattan Island mm. take us from the inside game to the lively ball? It's indispensable. Cookins Bluff has everything to do with that. How come nobody knows it? How is Brooklyn able to put a black man on the field when no other big league community would consider it? by the way, including Manhattan and the Bronx. This has to do with baseball. You ever notice if you ask a why and how question about anything at all, it'll lead to another to another why and how question. And if you keep on going back, it'll lead you to, this is the boring part, it'll lead you to natural history. True. Hey, Chris, if you really want to understand the why and how in baseball, Chris. you're going to get to natural history. Absolutely. And I'm sorry. It's not boring. It's no. cool. boring. No, Chris, well, it's, Peter, it's Peter, boring we'll look to my sister. To your, we'll look forward to your presentation. Okay. Chris, I want you to uh, mention something to you. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for joining us, uh, first of all. Uh, but I want you to uh, mention that a couple of things here. I went to the last uh, Giant Dodger game, played uh, in the Polo Grounds on my 10th birthday, September oh. 8, 1957, when uh, the Dodgers took a 2 nothing lead in the first inning, and then Mason oh. Japonski hit consecutive triples, and then Hank Sauer hit a two-run homer in the fourth inning for 3-2 oh. to two lead that held up. That's <laughs> the first part. Now, when it gets to ballparks, they, in the beginning, it was just Camden Yards. Then they put Oriole Park at Camden Yards. They put Ricky Henderson Field at O.Co. Coliseum. And our group is trying to get Willie Mays Field at Oracle Park. 
uh, but we kind of come on deaf ears of uh, Larry Bear. It's not going anywhere. I tried starting this a couple of years ago. There may have been other people that have went before me that made a, an effort to do so, but in any event, uh, it's, it's fine, and, and I hope one day it comes to fruition. Good luck. That's a noble project. It's necessary, and I wish you all the luck in the world. That should happen. All right. Thank so you, Chris, Gordon. again, thank you so much. My Thanks pleasure, Gary. Thank you. thank you. Give it up for Chris. We'll see you guys. Great next seeing week. all of you. We'll be in touch. Thanks for awesome. the great questions, for all of your passion and energy. I'll see you all soon, okay? All right. Be well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Well. I will. Gary, thank, thank you, brother. Chris. Great one, Gary. Thank you. You're